Induction is a dumb idea. You think you find a pattern, like a chicken gets fed every day, not beheaded. Then one day the pattern breaks. Pattern breaks happen all the time. How do you know when patterns will break or what factors are relevant to whether you have a situation where the pattern should also work? Like, if the farmhouse is a different color, can you apply what you saw for the, from about the chicken on one farm to this other farm? Does the farmhouse color matter? Is that a relevant factor? If this chicken has a different height than the previous one, does that matter? If it's a different weight, does that matter? If it has a different number of feathers, does that matter? The data does not tell you which pieces of data you should compare and which you can ignore. So there's two big problems there. One, about like which data to pay attention to, which um, pieces of data are like part of the patterns that matter. And two, when will a pattern break? Even if you find a pattern and you figure out like which um, factors matter to the pattern, patterns break. Sometimes they break. The data doesn't tell you when patterns break or why they break. You have to understand the causes um, to know these things. Looking at causes and explanations of what's going on and concepts gives you a way to understand under what circumstances a pattern would break and what factors are relevant to the pattern and what's irrelevant. Like when you know what the cause is, then you can tell what's relevant to causing it and what isn't part of the cause. Like the farmhouse color is not a cause. Another example, bread nourishes. What about mold? What if it has a bite out of it? Is it still safe? How old can it be? What colors are okay and which aren't? The data doesn't tell you these things. The data doesn't help you understand things like it depends what the bite out of it was taken by. Like if it was a rabid animal, now it's dangerous. Um, and mold is a relevant factor, whereas there are other factors that are irrelevant, like that there's a cherry on top of the bread, or the beiger was aken, Asian, or the bread was baked on a Wednesday, not a Saturday. Those things don't matter. Was the bakery built of brick or wood? Does it matter like what time of day you eat the bread to whether it nourishes you or it's unsafe? Right, there's so many factors, and the data doesn't help you sort out and figure out which factors matter. And you certainly don't sort this out by looking through the data, checking every fucking factor and seeing it, is there a correlation, is there a pattern? If you try to look at everything, you will find that there are infinitely many correlations and patterns, most of which are irrelevant red herrings. And you'll never know like which ones actually matter. And as a logical matter, there are in fact infinitely many patterns that fit any data set. Any finite data set, you have infinitely many patterns that fit it and have the next data point be literally anything which is pretty simple. You just, you take all the data sets so far, then you add anything as the next data point or anything as the next like end data points, like whatever you want, arbitrary junk data, that's next. And you take the entire thing and you just repeat it infinitely and you have an infinitely repeating pattern and it fits all the data so far. And it predicts as the next several data points, literally anything. And you can make infinitely many versions of that with every single thing predicted next and it fits the data perfectly. The data can't differentiate between those things. So once you start thinking about causes, it helps you focus your investigation. Um, Popper says you want to do the searchlight theory of knowledge. You, you need to think like a searchlight where you're deciding where to look, not like a sponge or a bucket where you're just absorbing a lot of water or having a lot of water poured into you, like knowledge being water in the metaphor. Um, so you don't want to be a passive receptacle that like knowledge floods into, which is kind of the inductivist view that all this observation data pours into us. And then if we're not biased and we look at it properly, we can see the patterns and learn things. Um, whereas the right view is not the, the data comes from the world to us and teaches us. It's we look at the world, we investigate. Um, we focus our attention on pieces of the world like a spotlight and we try to learn about them and understand them. And we go looking for what we think might be important because there's infinitely many things out there we could look at and we have to select which ones to focus on. And we have to make judgment calls about that. So you guess some causal explanations. You can't just automatically know them and you can't infer them from the data. The data does not logically imply what they are. You have to guess them. You have to think like it could be this, it could be that. You brainstorm. And then you come up with ones that make logical sense to you. You come up with ones that you think are rational. You come up with ones that fit all kinds of ideas you have about what is a good idea, what makes sense, what's reasonable in the world and so on. Um, you filter out like these explanations, not only according to data, but according to philosophical and intellectual criticism, um, common sense, whatever else. And then when you have some ideas that pass your initial criticism, your intellectual criticism, then you look at 
what do these ideas say the causes are? And then given that, what kinds of data would be relevant or important? And then you can go investigate those particular factors once you've narrowed it down so you have some idea of where might be a good place to look. You don't want to go investigate all the data with no plan, like induction suggests. And back to the bread, if, if it looks totally normal, is it safe? Like if you have the pattern sort of somewhat identified, like you know that those various factors I was talking about are not relevant, or you know which ones are relevant and which ones aren't. Does that mean the bread is safe? No, there's pattern breaks. The bread might have ergot. Now, you might object. You might say, oh, I have a different version of induction. And it's true, there are many versions of induction. And a lot of them are um, designed with immuniz immunization strategies. They have they're made harder to criticize on purpose because there's been, you know, centuries of criticism of induction. So over the time, people have learned how to make it harder to criticize induction. How do I say it more vaguely? How do I say it to be ambiguous on a key point rather than taking a clear stand? Um, you know, how do I say things that just make it harder for people to debate it and argue with it and so on? And there's a lot of that. And there's also honest people who just have a different version. They think, you know, induction works this way, not that way. So what do I think about that? I think there aren't clear written statements that provide a working version of induction. Like, just point me to this is the book that says, here's induction, here's how it works. Gives me all the answers, deals with Popper and other criticisms, like Russell is the one who uh, gave the chicken example I used earlier. Like, where is that? Where are the people willing to answer me? Where are the people willing to have a written debate with me about it? Asynchronously over time, so it's serious. Like, you know, we're not rushed. We don't have to answer in real time. We don't mishear each other in writing. Um, take our time. You can you can take a week or two to answer something, and we'll go back and forth, and we'll get to the bottom of it, and carefully avoid like major tangents and distractions, and and stay on point. You know, I'm happy to do that. I've been happy to do that for many years continuously. No one wants to do it, and it's not just because I'm obscure or, or low social status or something. David Deutsch, um, for many years would have been happy to do that. And he's a published author. He's a member of the Royal Society. He's an award-winning physicist. He won a $100,000 prize. Like, he's fancy enough. He's high status enough. And he talks with fancy people like Richard Dawkins and many others. But he can't get that kind of a debate. He can't get that kind of serious interest in figuring out the truth of the matter. No one wants to hash it out with him. Induction does not have representatives of it who say, it's right, I know it's right, I'll debate it, I'll argue it, etc. Um, it lacks people who will answer questions and criticism about it. And that is what makes it really hard to engage with, because I can pick like a version of it, and I could go find a inductivist book or article or something and point out errors in it. Um, but it, that doesn't do a good job of changing people's minds, because they're always like, oh, well, one of the other things of induction is better, or even if it's flawed, you know, somehow it could probably be improved or something. So there aren't clear enough targets for criticism that if I refuted like that specific version, then people would actually take notice and start changing their minds. Um, there, there aren't good things that represent induction that you can engage with. Um, it's all just this vague morass of thousands of different authors, thousands of different opinions, and they can't even work out among themselves what they think the right approach is. And then, you know, present it to the other side and say, here's induction, uh, can you refute this? They, they haven't done that. And they don't seem to be very good scholars in general. Like, There's a lack of scholarship in the world, and it's reflected in the inductivist community. Um, because, for example, there's a book with approximately 40 essays criticizing Popper. And then in the second half of the book, you get his replies to every single one. And then there's no follow-ups. There's no one who says, ah, oh, here's where Popper's reply in essay 28 went wrong. Um, here's what he missed, or here's where his argument was wrong. You know, he answered all these outstanding criticisms. He did so much work to say, all right, everyone, tell me what's wrong with what I said. And then he went through and answered everything. And then none of them followed up and said, oh, but here's, here's like your second mistake, you know? The, the state of the debate. Like, I try to look at things in terms of what is the objective state of the debate in the world. And what I see is that Popper answered 40 critics. And then it was just left at that. Like, he answered all the critics and that's where we are. And no one has said something new. And what I want to see from like a new critic, because there are, you know, a few that have essays on why Popper's wrong or something. What I'd like to see from them, instead of just low quality and 
misrepresenting proper positions and the standard things is, you know, start your essay by saying, I've actually reviewed the literature. I'm familiar with the standard criticisms of Popper. And um, here's how I can improve one of them so it defeats Popper's um, rebuttal. Or um, I think I have something different to say that's not in those previous criticisms, um, which I have read, and then I actually have something different to say. You know, if you say one of those things, you'd get my attention more. But no one does that for some reason. So, right, I think critics should try to point out, like, of the existing debate, which points do they agree and disagree with? Where do they have something new to add? Rather than just starting at the beginning every time. You should build on the previous debate rather than starting over. Um, but people generally don't do that. And that's not specific to Popper stuff. You just, you see these problems everywhere, but they're, this is just one example of them. And it sucks and it makes it harder for intellectual progress to happen. Um, I call it a lack of paths forward, and I have essays on paths forward, and I'll link a couple in the show notes. And if you go to fallibleideas.com, um, there's a on the main page there's an eth- essay called Paths Forward, and then at the end of the essay there's links to other material on it. And also the people who criticize Popper, there's there's no way to correct them on their mistakes, and they're not interested in like follow ups. They're not like, okay, I think I found something wrong with Popper. Can any Popperian tell me an answer to this that I didn't think of? They're not like, you know, I've given a new criticism that no one thought of when Popper was alive. Um, So he didn't get the chance to answer it, but can any of his fans now answer it? You know, you should give the other side like a chance to answer you when you have a criticism. But instead, they're just like, here's why Popper's bad. And then they don't want to talk about it. Um, They don't want to answer questions about it. They don't want to be corrected when they misquoted Popper or misrepresented what he said or whatever, and so on. And that's been my experience with quite a few of these people. And so, yeah, I have this kind of problem on most issues. There's a lack of public public intellectuals on the other side who will engage with questions and criticism or write statements of their position which address the issues I think matter, like the points I think are key points. So often when I read things, they're writing from like a very different perspective than mine. And so what I think gets a, is a key point, they omit it or they ignore it or they leave it ambiguous or something. So in order for us to actually engage, um, they need to actually find out like, this is my perspective on what matters and uh, what is your answer to that? Like they just literally haven't even told me what they think about what I think the key issue is a lot of the time. So without any back and forth, it's hard to do anything with their material. I'm just like, well, that is just like all the other ones and doesn't deal with this point Popper brought up. So it makes it hard to address the topic. And then, yeah, all the inductivists like disagree with each other. There's a ton of flaky people that, and even if I convince like a couple inductivists, it won't convince the other ones because none of them are like a representative. um, None of them are arguing with me on the basis of something like canonical where if if I can refute it, then all the other objectives would be like, oh, well, that was also my position and it just got refuted. I better look at this. It's all so like disorganized and lacks like leadership. And that's just standard with um with like all the intellectual fields in general, which is really sad and makes it hard to criticize things and improve things and make progress and get errors corrected. And there's just a, a broad lack of debate. Like in academic publishing, they don't really have debates. They, um, like, reply articles are are not common, and you can't go back and forth very much. Like, they have limited space to publish, and they won't publish very many articles. And so they're just, like, the publishing format of academic journals doesn't allow for and doesn't facilitate very much actual discussion and debate. And they certainly don't expect people to actually talk something out to the point of, like, resolving the disagreement and figuring out what was right. That's just not expected and not really tried for. And that's really sad because you need to actually try to get to the bottom of things. Instead of saying, let's agree to disagree, everything's muddy and gray. Um, no, there's there's black and white answers, there's truth, and we can make progress on them. And not all the positions are reasonable. And we can sort that out, but people mostly won't. Oh, and these people, in addition to... 
it's hard to get them to like explain everything or whatever. But also, it's hard to get people to just cite something and say this this particular thing written by it could be themselves, it could be someone else. Um, they, it's hard to get someone to just cite something and say this book is what I think. Um, if you can refute this, then you'll have refuted me. Like it's hard to get. If they won't talk to you, they also won't give you proxies um, that would save them a ton of time. Because it's like, okay, having a personal conversation with me would take a while. But if you just point me to the book that's like your beliefs and say to me, if I can refute that book, then you'll be really interested. You know, that would be a reasonable way forward. It would save them time. It would get rid of, um, it would get like the masses to stop bothering them. Because people are concerned that if you like deal with all your critics and whoever contacts you, it'll take too long and most of them will be dumb. But if you start off with like a challenge, it's just like, you know, here, refute this book. Um, most people aren't going to do that. They're just going to give up at that point. They can't do that. They don't have an answer or a way to do that. But it would let people who actually have something important to say, who can correct you on something, um, be able to continue things. Another related issue is... In general, you need back and forth to get anywhere when you have two smart, knowledgeable people talking who disagree. And the reason is they're both familiar with like what are the standard initial questions and criticisms um, that opponents offer. You know, if you consider like a knowledgeable socialist and a knowledgeable capitalist as an example, um, whatever my like initial arguments for why socialism sucks are, he's heard them before and he's going to have answers. And then I have answers to his answers. And then he has answers to that. He's, he's heard that before. He's, he's gotten to step two in the debate before. But then I have answers to that. And then he has answers. And you can go back and forth five, even 10 times before you get to the point where someone says something new and the other guy has to stop and think and say, oh, I never heard that before. I've never thought of that. Let me think about it. Um, you can go back and forth through just the standard layers of argument before you get to the new thing. Um, and that's completely fine and normal. Like it makes sense that um, people who are experienced debaters who've had these debates before, they have uh, answers to all the, the starting arguments and follow-up answers for the next points and follow-up answers for the next points. And that's good that they know that much. And then, but what you need then is some patience because you have to actually work through that. And you can't skip all the steps. That, this is another important point. Um, because you might say, well, if I know what the, what he's going to say, and then what I'm going to say, and then what he's going to say, and then what I'm going to say, if I know all that in advance, why don't I just skip skip to the good part? And the reason is because um, they often have like three answers. So it's like my initial argument is this, and then they have three standard choices. And then whichever one they say, um, I have a standard next argument, and then there's three standard choices for what they say next, and then I have an argument that I'm going to use, and then there's three choices for them, and so on. And from their perspective, every time I'm saying something, there were three choices I could have said or sometimes more. And so you, um, if you want to predict everything and skip steps, it branches too much. Because you have to say, well, if you say this, I have this argument. If you say this, I have this argument. If you say this, I have this argument. If you do that one level ahead, it's OK, because you're just doing three branches. But if you try to do that two levels ahead, now you're at nine branches. If you try to do it four levels ahead, you're at um, 81 branches. Right, so that's like way too much work. So you can't skip very many steps. You don't want to say, if you have this answer, then this answer, then this answer, then this answer, here's what I would say next. And then do that 81 different times to cover every possibility. That's not going to work. So it's better if you just say, okay, here's my first comment. What do you say back? Like, which of the ones is it? And then here's my second comment. And you just go back and forth and see which, uh, which set of answers each of you agrees with. And then you get to the point where someone says something that the other guy isn't prepared for. And then you think about it and have a, a serious, important discussion. But this doesn't happen because most people won't discuss much at all. And when they will discuss, um, they'll go back and forth with you like two times and then they'll be like, this isn't getting anywhere. I'm busy, blah, blah, blah. And they give up and they stop. And they're like, I don't have to answer like dozens of questions from you, you know? So, so by stopping like really early on, they never let you get to the important parts. Like, like someone writes an anti-induction essay. And so I have like a question and they answer the question. And then I have a follow-up question and they answer that. And then I have a third follow-up question and they're like, oh, I don't want to talk anymore. Um, but they actually have to answer like more questions than that before we can get to the point where like the new important stuff gets said. That's that's a really common thing. And so people are sabotaging discussion because they don't understand that the smart, knowledgeable people already have like prepared answers back and that can go back and forth. And it could be, it could, it shouldn't take very long. It should happen really quickly because I'm saying things I already know and you're saying things you already know. And then we'll have to stop and think when we get to a point where someone says something the other guy doesn't already know. 
Um, so the early parts, we already know it. Um, like, yes, it's less interesting, but it should be really quick. You shouldn't be getting stuck on that part. It should be really easy. And if you get tired of answering those things, just write them down and put them on an FAQ web page. And then say, here's the FAQ. And uh, I'll only answer questions that are not already on the FAQ. And problem solved. But anyway, so it's hard to get past like the first few levels with people. The more knowledgeable people are generally, oh, I'm too busy. And then the less knowledgeable people, um, they get confused. They don't even know the standard arguments. You have to try to like teach them their side because they're getting lost, um, which is a big hassle. And they don't want you to put words in their mouth, but like they're fucking up their side and saying things that like most people on their side would disagree with or think were wrong. And and then it's just like you're just dealing with their personal misconceptions and ignorance um, rather than the topic itself. So that's not so great. And so people just get impatient and lose interest too fast. They have wrong expectations about what it takes to make progress on intellectual issues, or they just aren't interested enough in doing that. Um, and by the way, this particular explanation, the thing about the levels of back and forth, um, I explained this exact thing to Alex Epstein, and he wouldn't talk about it. Um, it came up because he would not talk about some of my criticisms of his work, and I ended up breaking with him over it, because I wrote a couple essays for him, I did some research for him, um, I commented on a draft of Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. Um, you know, we collaborated. He wasn't ignoring me because I was just like some random guy on the internet. Um, you know, he thought I was really smart. He praised me. Um, I broke with him. He wouldn't break with me, even when I was really pushy about this stuff. Um, he didn't want to talk about um, the, these kind of methodology issues, nor did he want to talk about, uh, say, uh, how some of his comments about mental illness were bad or how some of his scholarship was too sloppy. Um, he didn't want to talk about those things or the methodology. He was too busy, too focused on what he was doing. But I was, you know, I was pointing out ways that what he was doing wouldn't work as well as he thought, so he should care. But anyways, despite that, um, he just wanted to agree to dis disagree, leave it alone. Um, I should just respect that he doesn't owe me answers to questions, etc. And I was like, no, no, if you're, if you're not going to rationally think about these things, I don't want to work with you anymore. So I had to break with him when he was just like, yeah, you have smart points, but I'm busy. It's it's so sad how people are. The thing about like not owing him answers, I think is interesting, or him not owing me answers. Because of course he doesn't owe me answers in like a personal way, like a, an obligation to me. But like, doesn't he owe it to himself to be rational, to truth seek, to care about criticism um, and to, to deal with it instead of just ignoring criticism? Like it's so sad if one of your collaborators finds something you're doing wrong and tries to tell you, and you just won't listen. Um, like, how are you going to get corrected on your mistakes? A lot of what they do is they make like an initial evaluation. Like, if they think what you're saying is plausible, then they'll talk to you more. If they think if they find it implausible, then they don't want to talk about it. But that means whenever you have like a really big important point, a really original point, those are the ones they find implausible because it's like further from what they already know. It's like a, a bigger correction. It's less intuitive for them. And so those are the ones people want to talk about. It's hard to teach them like the best ideas um, or correct their bigger mistakes. So that that's bad because they're avoiding like the most important discussions, the ones with the highest possible payoff. Um, and so the other thing about this is I have an essay on this that I think is really relevant um, about how people can do this in a time efficient, reasonable way and deal with some criticism. Uh, it's called using intellectual processes to combat bias. Because what I think one of the big problems is, is they'll, they'll answer some critics, but they do it in a selective biased way, um, where they end up answering some of the ones that are easier and avoiding some of the most important ones. And I think that they should have a better process that keeps them objective and honest, um, so that they, they don't ignore uh, important criticisms in a biased way. So I will link that in the show notes.